Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 30th of October 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, the developers of Rome and 505 games lock horns, Nvidia Shield adds console mode, and DualShock 4 controllers now available for purchase. All this and the OC Remix track of the day is coming your way right about now. A zombie survival game by the name of Rome has had a fairly successful Kickstarter run with 3,500 backers and $102,000 pledged, which is more than double their $40,000 goal. However, a few days ago, they embroiled themselves in some controversy after accusing publisher 505 Games of copying the Rome idea after offering them a publishing deal some time ago. 505 Games recently released the title by the name of How to Survive, which the developer of Rome claimed was extremely similar and a direct ripoff of their title. However, it has come to light that footage of How to Survive, formerly named Monster Island, was released far before the Kickstarter for Rome and indeed before the publishing offer was given out. In a follow-up statement, the developer of Rome speculated that it was possible 505 Games contacted Ecosoft, the developers of How to Survive, after the publishing offer for Rome was turned down. They then gave an apology for basically starting all of this mess in the first place. This whole incident is something that I found very, very irritating because it shows a little bit of naivety from the developers of Rome to begin with, and also perhaps overestimation of what it is they're actually creating. Here's the thing, you're making a zombie survival game, like everybody else is right now. This was a desperation genre, and now it's a genre that's becoming rapidly saturated across the board. Zombie games have been insufferably frequent over the last couple of years, and they've not been done all that well. They have veered towards the idea of the kind of Walking Dead style of zombie survival. And I don't mean the Walking Dead game, I mean the concept behind the Walking Dead. This notion that it's not all about killing zombies. It moved away from that. It's now about survival in a zombie-infested post-apocalyptic world. And that's what a lot of games are trying to deal with, especially considering the success of the early DayZ, the Armor 2 mod, which did absurdly well, and that spawned a whole bunch of clones. Now, we have some legitimate clones, some actual clones, like the War Z, for instance, which has been proven time and again to simply be a retooled War Inc. that was designed very specifically to confuse people and has successfully done so, by the way. I see so many people posting, oh, yeah, Daisy was such a ripoff when they actually mean the War Z because the two had very similar names. And that was, of course, compounded by the fact that you then get the movie of the book World War Z, which confused the hell out of people once again. However, when it comes to cloning somebody else's game or taking ideas or anything along those lines, War Z didn't actually do anything wrong in that respect. It was a terrible game and the developers were highly dishonest in a wide variety of different ways, but the fact that they made a game that's very similar to Daisy is not actually a crime whatsoever. And we are not talking about flagrant stealing of assets or anything like that. Even if Monster Island hadn't been created and actually released before Rome was even a game. And that's the most comical thing about it, in my opinion. We've got guys that are doing a Kickstarter project saying, Oh yeah, this game that's already out copied us. Your game isn't done yet. The scheduled release for this is in January, so I assume the amount of money they actually needed, which really isn't actually explained anywhere on the Kickstarter whatsoever, which I view as a cardinal sin, by the way. So the game is well on its way to being made, but it's not done yet. The Kickstarter originally began back in February, and since then, obviously they've been developing things, but Monster Island was way before that. And even if that weren't the case, even if 505 looked at Rome, didn't get the deal, and then decided, you know what, we're going to support some other company and we're going to tell them, you know what, make a game like this. There's nothing actually wrong with that. Here's the thing you have to understand. Game mechanics are not patented, and there's a good reason for that. Before you go after me with that one exception of mini games on the loading screen that actually is patented, that's not really a game mechanic. Think of how dreadful an industry would be in if those kind of things weren't borrowable, I suppose is perhaps the best way to describe it. I don't say steal, because it's like stealing the idea of moving a camera in the right way. Game mechanics are what make a game. Weak game mechanics destroy games frequently across the board. Doesn't matter how good your story is. If your game mechanics suck, 
then the chances are people are not going to enjoy your game, which is why I've said before, I prefer games with strong stories and minimal mechanics versus games with strong story and bad mechanics. Yeah, if you try to be too much of a game and you can't do it, you end up with a worse game than if you just made the bloody thing an interactive movie to begin with. Entire genres spring up around these ideas. Yeah? That's what happens. That's what game mechanics can actually generate. A lot of the stuff that Rome is using in its game was first done by somebody else. Watching the prototype video right now, you can very clearly see that the combat is extremely similar to games like, say, Nation Red, which has been out for a number of years. And really, it's more of your standard isometric twin stick for the most part when it comes to the combat. There are certainly some very interesting ideas in it, don't get me wrong, but don't tell me that they haven't been done before. The science of making games is very similar to the culinary arts. It's the idea of combining different ingredients together to make a delicious dish. You don't patent an ingredient. You can't say, oh, I used apples in my dish, so you can't use apples in yours. That's absolute nonsense. And let's be frank, this is a game that is jumping on a bandwagon. Yeah? And that's not a bad thing. That's a great way to do business, as far as I'm concerned. And I have said time and again, I love iteration in genres because that means we get better games eventually. And it takes a while. It often involves a lot of games that suck, which is why a lot of zombie survival games just absolutely suck. And Rome looks pretty good, honestly. It looks enjoyable. I think I'd probably play it. It's a nice mix of arcade action with some crafting stuff, the ability to construct fortresses, lay traps and things like that. That's great. You know, that's what I was hoping from games like Fort Zombie, which ended up being absolutely awful. But you don't get to go around after jumping into an already saturated genre with many, many other developers either having released a game in it or currently developing one and saying, these guys copied us. This was a horrible move, frankly. And I think they're very fortunate that Echosoft and 505 doesn't go after them for libel on this one because it was damaging to them. There's no question because the people that believed them, well, now they're not going to attempt to buy How to Survive because they actually believe it was a copy and Rome damaged themselves in the process. This is not the kind of thing that any developer should really be accusing another of. And they just need to accept, look, if your game is good, it will shine on its own merits. And it doesn't matter how many mechanics you borrowed, as long as you weren't directly stealing assets. Mechanics are not assets. Ideas cannot be stolen in that way. Nvidia Shield was released recently in the US. It's still not available in the EU. However, Nvidia have released a rather large update for their handheld Android console. The most prominent feature that they have enabled is called console mode, which allows you to plug an HDMI cable into the Shield and use a Bluetooth controller to essentially stream games from your PC directly to your television with the Shield processing everything and acting as a portable games console, pulling information over your wireless network. They've also announced that the game stream technology, which powers this, as well as the ability to play PC games over your wireless network on your actual Shield itself, has left beta and now supports 720p at 60 frames per second. Nvidia has also announced that they will be looking to add 1080p functionality a little bit later on and the list of games that support the game stream technology is now over 50 and include new titles such as Batman Arkham Origins and Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. It's been an interesting story behind this little niche device honestly. Most people that have used it seem to have a fairly positive reception to it and I've used it and I like it a lot for what it is. It's just a rather curious idea that's got this kind of niche functionality to it and it also tries to pack a bunch of functions into the same device, hoping to kind of capture your interest with at least one of them, and then maybe you use the other functions later down the road. It's actually what I ended up finding with my iPad when I picked it up originally. I really didn't have much use for it, but eventually I figured out different ways to use it in my daily life, and it actually became handy to some degree. And I think that's what Nvidia are hoping for with the Shield as well, but they're targeting it very specifically towards PC gamers. The streaming tech is interesting because it's clearly where the industry is going right now when it comes to PC gaming and the control of the living room. That big term that keeps popping up over and over again. Companies want to control the living room space. They want their device to be in there, not the other guys. They want to be able to take up a significant chunk of your free time using their devices, and they want to do it with things like inbuilt stores, which this obviously has as well, because they want you to buy media. Why do you think Apple wants dominance? Because it wants people to sign up to iTunes. It wants them to rent movies and buy music and 
TV series and things like that. And it's exactly the same reason why everyone else is trying to do the same bloody thing. Microsoft is way more focused on it this time around. They want you to use Xbox Live to buy that stuff. PSN has exactly the same thing. Even Samsung Smart TVs have that kind of idea going for them. And in the case of the Shield, it's a little different because I feel that they want to make the PC more relevant around the house and they also want you to buy at least the 600 series graphics cards because the game stream does not work with anything below a 650. So it's a bit of an incentive to upgrade. Gotta say though, interesting move because this is basically the first pseudo steam box that is purchasable at a reasonable price. You can plug it into any television and then you can stream from your base station machine over the wireless network. That to me actually has value, surprisingly enough. My PC is my office, my television isn't. So if I had something that was highly portable and I could stream my games at high enough quality to my television easily, then I might from time to time. There are some games which play absolutely fine with a controller and I'd rather play them on the comfortable couch with the bigger screen and I don't want to drag a PC in there to do it. And it's the same issue with something like, say, the Steam Box. If it's not hyper portable, then it would be a little bit of a pain in the ass because you're basically just setting up another PC under your television, which I feel defeats the point of the exercise. I know that Valve are looking to have these things be more portable. We've seen the dimensions and the weight of them. They're not that crazy. Admittedly, some of the higher end ones are still toting Titans, which are pretty heavy to say the least. And power supplies are also an issue. But this to me seems like a nice little solution to a problem that a lot of people didn't necessarily know they had. I want to see more quality from it, certainly. 720p, 60 FPS is not bad for some games, especially if you're far away enough from the television. But obviously the dream goal is 1080p, 60, and then possible 4K after that. I wonder if that's even achievable. The artifacting that would be present on a stream matters a little bit less as a result of the fact that you're further away from the television. It's harder to notice that stuff. It's like, do you notice the artifacting on Netflix? Maybe you do. Depends. I mean, I have a 55-inch TV and I can see it in some circumstances, but most of the time, you know, I just ignore it. I wonder if it would be easier to see with gameplay as opposed to, say, 24 or 30 frames per second video. But to me, that's a pretty strong feature. Honestly, I think I'm going to pick one of these things up because it seems like I could actually find a use for it now. I didn't really value the idea of being able to play a PC game on like a five inch screen, but I do value the idea of being able to play PC games on my television, which is the other side of the house. If you can do it without any fussing and you can basically do it from the shield itself without having to access your PC, then that's a pretty strong feature. It might seem niche now, but it seems like this is the direction we're going. I mean, Valve has already said, this is what we want to do. And plenty of other companies are also getting on that particular bandwagon. So this is going to happen. It's a natural extension of what you can already do. The ability to share your media around the house with various different devices. So the next logical step is to be able to do that with gaming as well. And Shield seems like a nice little portable way of doing that. And finally, you can now buy DualShock 4 controllers. Apparently, they had no street date on them whatsoever, so GameStop was able to sell them earlier. And you can now purchase the controllers from Amazon and other popular websites as well. Admittedly, the low, low price of $60 might be something that puts people off, especially considering that the functionality that the controller has will not work in full without a PlayStation 4. However, Sony has stated that most of the functions are compatible with PS3. So if you're looking to upgrade your controller for your console, that will work just fine. And it is also functional with the PC as well. I've ordered mine. I should be getting it over the next couple of days. And then I can give you a full impressions of it when it comes to working with PC games and as to whether or not it is actually worth a purchase for your PC kit. But my initial impressions of the two controllers left me with the opinion that the DualShock 4 is a more comfortable and accurate controller to use. Not really a huge difference between the two, and it's going to come down to a lot of personal preference. I know some people still don't like the dual stick at the bottom design as opposed to the Xbox One and 360 controller where you have one higher than the other. But the main problem that I had with the Xbox One controller is that it actually left red rings on my fingers because of the grips around the sticks. They were a little bit harsh on the skin which is not ideal, whereas here you've got this sort of concave in and then slightly raised in the center design for the sticks for the DualShock 4, which to me seem reasonably comfortable. The triggers look pretty good as well, and overall the thing has a really nice premium feel to it. 
Not a huge advancement on what we currently have, but it looks like a solid option. And I have to wonder exactly what kind of support will be put into place. If you wanted to use the PS3 controller with the PC, then you usually had to bind the keys yourself, use something like, say, Motion Joy. This time around, they're claiming support from day one, but I have to wonder how many developers will actually put it in there without you having to mess around yourself. The biggest advantage that the 360 pad currently has when it comes to PC gaming is that X input allows it to work right out of the box and everything is properly bound and most games even have support to show you button prompts on the 360 pad as opposed to on the keyboard. I don't honestly know how far support is really going to go for the DualShock 4 controller which as a result might mean that the next generation of controllers that ends up winning out on the PC as an alternative to keyboard and mouse, unless of course the Valve controller comes along and stomps everything into the floor, would end up being the Xbox One controller because the X input standard would remain. That's the question isn't it? Will the X input standard remain or will it be swept away by stuff like the Valve controller? and the DualShock 4. It's an exciting time regardless, and I'm hoping that developers jump on board with the idea that yes, PC gamers might use the DualShock 4, and it would be really good if they could put official support for it in their games. Alright folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the content patch. Before I go, I'd like to give you the OC Remix track of the day. The Mega Man games are definitely a popular subject when it comes to OC Remix. This one is of course no exception. It comes from the recently released Badass Boss Themes uh, Volume 2, and the original tracks that it remixes are Dr. Wily stage number one from the original Mega Man and Top Man stage from Mega Man 3. It's by an artist called Flex Style, and as far as I can tell, it's pretty damn hard trance with perhaps a couple of little dubstep elements thrown in there for good measure. And it's called Top This. It's pretty damn good, and hopefully you enjoy it very much. I certainly did. I'll see you next time.